Hello, my name is Adriana Zito Livingston. I'm the Coastal Projects Coordinator for the Nature Conservancy's New Jersey chapter. It's been my privilege for the last 10 years to oversee um, our participation in the annual horseshoe crab spawning survey. So I'm excited to share with you today um, a little bit about my favorite organism, my favorite animal, the American horseshoe crab. They have a spectacular migration and they're a really important conservation species. So thank you for tuning in and watching this video. All right, these amazing animals are Earth's top survivors. They have been around for over 450 million years, which is longer than the, uh, the dinosaurs. So they walked the Earth long before the dinosaurs and their shape actually hasn't really changed much since. Um, they are not only fascinating creatures in their own right, but many animals depend on these species, including shorebirds that have an amazing migration of their own. Um, they have an amazing body plan that I'll tell you a little bit about today. And um, humans also have a lot to thank horseshoe crabs for, so I'm excited to share that with you. Um, I'm also going to share a little bit about some of our concerns about this species and also conservation actions, so things that the Nature Conservancy and other conservation organizations are doing to ensure the survival of this very important species. So as I said, these animals are highly adapted. Their body plan has not changed um, since around uh, the time of the dinosaurs. So for oh, hundreds of millions of years, they have looked the same. So this is a fossil horseshoe crab. This means that they're highly adapted. Their body plan serves their lifestyle very well and therefore they haven't had any cause to change. So their bodies are perfectly designed for life, not only on the ocean floor where they spend most of their time, but it also gives them the ability to leave the water annually in May and June um, to be able to spawn and lay their, horseshoe, uh, lay their eggs on the beaches. So they're pretty phenomenal and well-planned. So evolutionarily, they got it right. So there are four species of horseshoe crabs around the world. Um, three species in Asia, you can see my mouse, and then only one species in North America that's found pretty much from Mexico to Maine on the eastern coast of North America. And so our horseshoe crab species, the one that's near and dear to my heart, is Limulus polyphemus, the American horseshoe crab. They make one of the world's greatest migrations. Um, they come into the Delaware Bay and we have the chance to see them there, which is really exciting to me. Another fun fact, or I guess a surprising fact about horseshoe crabs is they are not true crabs. So none of the four species of horseshoe crabs are really actually crabs. Um, they're in the animal kingdom most closely related to spiders. So if you get it, once you get a look at the underside of, of one of these animals, you'll see what I mean. So they're more closely related to spiders and other terrestrial insects than they are um, sorry, and other arachnids than they are um, true crabs that live um, in coastal areas. So part of their amazing anatomy gives them the ability, as I said, to leave the water. So what you can see in this image, if you can see my mouse, is the tail of this animal has a long spike and it's not actually used for defense. It's not poisonous like a stingray spike. It's actually just a lever and it's pointed so that it can dig down into the sand or into the mud or into stone, wherever this horseshoe crab has ended up on its back. So these are actually two horseshoe crabs together, the male in the back and the female in the front. And the male is trying to get them flipped back over to their right side. And he's doing that by using his telson. There's also a really strong shell hinge. The strongest part on this animal's body is the point where their head meets the rest of their body. So they can stick the spine in the sand, leverage themselves up and get themselves turned back over. A little bit like the neck of a turtle, if you've ever seen a turtle get stuck on its back. So it's another important survival aspect. These animals actually have 10 eyes on their body. So two really obvious ones, we have these compound eyes, so com more complex eyes on either side of their head. They also have two that look a little bit like nostrils. Those are um, endoparietal eyes. So they're light sensing eyes. 
that are on the front of the body, they have some light sensors on the underside, and they actually have light sensors also on their tail, so along their tail. And so by studying these eyes on some of the oldest animals that are still living today, we've learned a lot about vision, sight, and eye development. So their compound eyes can actually make out black and white shapes. Um, so it's close to true vision. So a lot has been learned about human eyes by studying the, the eyes of the horseshoe crab. For the horseshoe crab, having this number, this variety of eyes and photosensors gives them the ability to be able to move around in their environment safely, locate food, and also orient as they have to come up onto the beach. They can um, sense the moon phase. Um, by looking at by being able to sense the light and get up onto the beach and then also be able to return safely to the water based on some of those photoreceptors. One of the coolest things about these crabs is that they have the ability to live underwater and draw oxygen and survive and also come up onto the land and be able to survive. So that's a, due to a really important adaptation called a book gill. So here on the underside of the animal, we have these complex gill structures. So a little bit like the gill of a fish, but these look a little bit like a paperback book. And their job is to stay wet. And when they stay wet, it takes um, a really long time for them to dry out, depending on the, the temperature and the, the conditions. If you've ever like soaked a paperback book, left it out in the rain or spilled a cup of coffee on it, you know how long it takes that book to dry back out. And the same concept here. Using these book gills, if they can stay wet, they can draw oxygen into their bodies across the moist surface of these book gills. So this is one of the softest parts of their bodies. It's one of the most vulnerable and they like to stay on their fronts so that those book gills can stay as moist in the sand as possible. But as long as those gills are wet and intact, they have a really strong chance to survive on land while they're up laying their eggs or fertilizing eggs. So this is another um, image of the underside of a horseshoe crab. This is actually a female, and I'll tell you a little bit more about telling males from females in a bit. Um, but this is a very large female. Again, you can see these book gill structures kind of along her abdomen. And so uh, a couple of really cool features. On the underside, kind of underneath those pincers, um, in the middle of the head is actually where the mouth is. And horseshoe crabs don't chew like you or I, they don't have a true jaw. As they walk, the base of their legs have teeth on them and they rub together. So once a worm or um, a small crustacean food items are put from the claws into that central area of their mouth, as they walk along, they're actually chewing and um, you know, softening their food so that they can digest it. So they chew by walking, which is, you know, they can walk and chew gum at the same time, I guess, from a, a critter standpoint. Um, one other feature before I go to the next slide is here are those book gills again. You can see they're on the abdomen. And these horseshoe crabs have amazing blue blood, and you can see kind of where that draws in the body. So the blood runs right along next to those book gills in little pockets or little membranes. And as these book gills stay wet, they can pull oxygen from the air and right into the blood. So why is their blood blue? This is a better image of the blood. Their blood is blue because we have an iron-based oxygen carrying protein in our blood, which makes our blood red in color. They have a copper-based oxygen carrying protein called hemocyanin. Ours is hemoglobin, theirs is hemocyanin, which has copper. And that's what gives it its rich blue color. So there, um, the color is just kind of the beginning as far as the, the important aspects of the blue blood of horseshoe crabs. You can see this is, um, this is an image of horseshoe crab blood that was actually collected from animals for a biomedical purpose. Um, their blood has a special protein in it called lysate and that compound, when it comes in contact with a very common bacteria or family of bacteria, um, that blood turns from liquid to solid, it gels. And that makes a visible change. You can actually see the change if it's outside of the horseshoe crab's body. So for the horseshoe crab, that keeps them, they can be in fairly dirty water and not really um, have bacterial infections because as soon as their blood comes in contact with a threat, with a bacterium, it's, I, it's uh, blood gels around that threat and they can pass it out of their body as waste. 
So for humans, there was actually a test developed to be able to tell if things are sterile in a medical environment. So most vaccines, um, any implants or prosthetics, um, anything that really enters the human body. This is the standard medical test, the current medical standard for sterility um, to make sure you know, equipment is safe for humans to use and not likely to cause infection, uses um, horseshoe crab blood, so lysate um, in it. So there's biomedical harvest of this blood from horseshoe crabs to be able to produce these tests. And so if you've ever had a vaccine, thank a horseshoe crab um, for their sacrifice. So I should also say in the extraction process, um, horseshoe crabs are bled, just a, a portion of their blood is bled out. So the, the animals, it's a non, um, not always non-lethal, but it is um, a harvest where the animal survives and is released back into the wild. Um, so it's the only ongoing harvest permitted in New Jersey. Um, horseshoe crabs come out of the water, as I've been saying, to spawn on the beaches. So Delaware Bay has the largest population of spawning horseshoe crabs in North America, um, in the world, really. So horseshoe crabs come into Delaware Bay from anywhere from Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, New York, um, come from the continental shelf into Delaware Bay and onto Delaware Bay beaches, which are relatively low and flat, um, they have nice calm water and big sand flats, which is the ideal spawning habitat for horseshoe crabs. So they come into both sides of the bay in New Jersey and Delaware. Um, they form these aggregations. The females leave the water and the males are attracted to the females. More than one male, as you can see, surrounds a female. She's laying her eggs in the sand and the males are doing external fertilization. So they are releasing sperm, which are fertilizing those eggs as she's burying. One of the reasons these animals have become so highly adapted is they have a lot of um, genetic diversity. So it's not a single male and a single female. There's 100,000 eggs or 200,000 eggs laid a season and multiple males are fertilizing those eggs. So they, um, they get a lot of genetic mixing, which gives them a lot of opportunities to adapt really quickly. Yep, so it's horseshoe crab spawning season now. They start uh, spawning when the water gets about 59 degrees. Um, we've done a lot of study to know that when the water gets to that temperature, horseshoe crabs start to emerge on, and come up onto the beaches. They come up specifically during the highest high tides of the season. So on the new moon and the full moon, we have the highest high tides and that puts horseshoe crabs right in the spot on the beach where the females can be burying their eggs and the males fertilizing them, they don't have to walk very far once they leave the water and they lay their eggs right there as the tide recedes. Because it's so high in the tide line, it's gonna stay moist enough for those eggs to develop, but not as not uh, super wet so that waves don't um, chip them away. This is another image. If you can tell the difference, it's important to tell the difference between males and females, especially when you're doing a spawning survey. So females are, almost twice as large as males. They're about the size of a dinner plate when they're sexually mature and the males are much smaller. And so um, this male you can see is much smaller in body size. As horseshoe crabs have been making their comeback though, we've needed another way to be able to tell females from males because once they're in that seven to eight year old age range, males and females can be fairly similar in size. And so you can do that by looking at the underside of a horseshoe crab. So the male horseshoe crab Again, these two are fairly similar in size. The male has this specialized first walking leg and it's, they call it kind of a boxing glove and it has a hook on it. That's a specialized walking leg that he uses to actually hook onto the back of the abdomen of a female. So as she leaves the water, he hooks right on there. This way he can be sure to end up wherever she's gonna lay her eggs without having to expend a ton of energy himself. And so the females don't have that first walking leg as a specialized leg. So all of their walking legs are chelate, so they're claws. And they use those for food manipulation, egg laying, etc. So again, this is the female down here in the bottom left, and this is the male. And the result of that spawning activity 
as I've said, females can lay up to 100,000 to 200,000 eggs in a season. They bury them deeply in the sand. And it should take about two, week, two weeks to a month, depending on air temperature and moisture, um, for the water to get right back to that sweet spot and for the young horseshoe crabs to be able to develop. So horseshoe crab eggs have two paths. They can, they can be buried in the sand, develop, or they can end up on the surface, which is where these eggs were when I uh, took this photograph. So these are billions of eggs on the surface of the sand um, that have been excavated by tide and excavated by other horseshoe crabs. And these are great food for shorebirds. So we'll get into that a little bit. Here's a close up of the eggs. When the eggs are laid, their yolk, um, so much like a chicken egg is a yellow yolk, um, the, the yolk of um, horseshoe crab eggs is green in color. So these are high in fat. Um, they're, they're very nutritious. Um, both for a developing horseshoe crab and also for, you know, as they as they grow and also for shorebirds. So let me go back one. So the density of eggs on the surface is in, due in part to water erosion. So wave action, kind of digging up those nests, depending on where they were positioned on the beach. Water can erode the nest if they were laid too low or the beach is too short. Um, the, other aspect and the more um, frequent, more frequently what happens is horseshoe crabs spawn in such incredible densities that females will come up and they'll lay their eggs. They'll you know, spread out as much as they can, but oftentimes they're kind of on top of each other and stacked in during a spawning event. Females go back out. Next night, the tide is in the same place. So different females come up onto the beach and they dig their nests. And they don't have a way to know that there's already been a nest dug there. So they're actually, to bury their own eggs, they're digging up eggs that were previously laid by a female on nights before up until that point. And so there's always this abundance. Um, when horseshoe crab spawning is um, going well, there's this super abundance of eggs that will never make it to become horseshoe crabs, but are a rich food source for other animals. So let's talk about becoming a horseshoe crab first. That's like a one in a billion chance. Um, it's why they lay so many eggs to hedge their bets. Um, over time, as I said, in about two weeks, the young horseshoe crab will eat that yolk. The egg will start to look a little bit more clear, a little bit more peachy, and then it'll swell with water as the, the horseshoe crab develops. And when they hatch out, this little, you know, the image in the hand, they're just miniature horseshoe crabs. Um, so their, their body looks already in that trilobite kind of form. They'll spend the first couple of years of their lives actually um, in the near shore in Delaware Bay. So they don't go out into the deep water, they stay in the shallows. So you may see um, as they grow, they shed their shells. So you may have seen horseshoe crab shells that are really teeny um, wash up onto the beach. When they're growing at first, they shed their shells every couple of weeks and then it slows down to months and it slows down to years until they reach sexual maturity. And so once they're adults, um, which as I said, for males, it takes five to seven years to reach adulthood. Um, they'll spend most of their time out on the continental shelf in um, outside of that summer season, come in to spawn and come up onto the beaches. For females, it takes eight to 10 years for them to reach sexual maturity. So they're a long lived species and it takes them a long time to get to that point where they can make 100,000 to 200,000 eggs per season. Once they reach that adult size, they don't shed their shells and they don't really continue to grow. So this can make it tricky for us to figure out how long horseshoe crabs live. Um, we've gotten a lot of information by uh, aging things that stick to horseshoe crabs. They're essentially just on the bottom and they get a lot of hitchhikers, so barnacles and other things that live on them. Um, and there's also a really intensive program led by US Fish and Wildlife Service um, and also a conservation partner, the American Littoral Society here in New Jersey to look at horseshoe crabs um, movements and ages by tagging them. Oh, I got it all right. So that's path one. Um, if they make it through the gauntlet, um, 
they become horseshoe crabs in five to 10 years, uh, adult mature horseshoe crabs. And then we see them on the beaches again. They have pretty high site fidelity. It's um, pretty likely that if horseshoe crabs hatched on Delaware Bay beaches, they may not be back right at that same beach, but they're gonna be back in the Delaware Bay to spawn once they're adults. Um, the other pathway is to become food. And you, can, you saw from that image of just the, the number of eggs that are on the surface that are available. It is really easy to, to access food that's very high in fat. And so um, shorebirds um, who have their own migration, like many come from South America and are on their way up to the Arctic to, um, to lay their eggs, have, uh, learned, have evolved to take advantage of Delaware Bay as a stopover habitat because of this rich abundance of horseshoe crab eggs in May and June. So they're coming from Argentina and they're on their way to um, the Arctic. They come to Delaware Bay and feed constantly for two weeks. There's a couple of different species. There's 11 species total of shorebirds that do this. And shorebirds as a, as a group, I should say, are very vulnerable because they do these long distance migrations. They um, are not, it's difficult, challenging to protect them because they spend time in so many places that you need to not protect one habitat. You need to protect a complex of habitats and Delaware Bay is one of those really important habitats. Um, so on the left, we have a ready turnstone. He's one of my favorites. Um, shorebirds, looks a little bit like Charlie Chaplin. They have bright orange legs. Um, so they feed on horseshoe crab eggs and this is a semi-palmated sandpiper um, here on the right. They also make a long distance migration. Um, the one, the poster child for the long distance migration, and I think the, the record holder is the red knot, the roofer red knot. Um, and so this bird is about the size of a robin. Um, they come all the way from Tierra del Fuego, which is down here at the bottom of Argentina. They stop over on the Delaware Bay, um, and then they go up to the Arctic um, to have their chicks. So they are... Um, very long distance migrants. Um, and because of that, their population, um, along with other shorebirds, but um, that they're critically, um, indeed, they're critically threatened. So they're, they were listed um, a few years ago as federally threatened species. So they're on the endangered species list as threatened, and they are an endangered species in New Jersey. So these guys, their populations are in real trouble, in part because of their dependence on horseshoe crab eggs. So they really need this stopover to go well. Um, so these birds show up in the Delaware Bay um, at the end of May, beginning of June. By then, horseshoe crabs should have been spawning for a couple of weeks. There should be um, a lot of eggs on the surface of the sand, readily available. Um, they feed nonstop for two weeks and they can double their body weight. And that's what they should be doing so that they can um, successfully make it to the Arctic in good enough condition to lay their eggs. Look at how cute. So they, um, when they get up to the Arctic, they lay their eggs right away. So it takes a lot of energy as well. The migration itself requires a lot of energy. So you need a lot of fat reserves, like your car has to be full of gas before you take a long road trip. Um, and then when they get there, it's like driving a long road trip and then doing a marathon or giving birth. Um, so it's really, um, really important that these animals make the most of that um, of the stopover in Delaware Bay. And so they can have their young and continue their own species. So this is a really famous um, red knot. His name is Moonbird. Um, he got that name because his migration um, by the time, so he hatched in, 90, in 1993. Um, he was last seen in 2014. Um, and so in his lifetime, he made that migration from Tierra del Fuego to Delaware Bay to the Arctic and back. Um, so, sorry, I'm reading this stat because it's amazing. So he was about 21 years old um, by the, you know, when he was last seen. And at that time, he had flown 480,000 miles um, during his lifetime. So he got the nickname Moonbird because that's the distance between um, Earth and the moon and back. Um, so he has flown, he flew quite a bit in his lifetime and was just a great um, ambassador species. So this again is a tagging study so that we can track a single bird on their migration. We learn a lot from these types of studies. 
um, and can really raise awareness about the peril of these species. Um, so horseshoe crabs and shorebirds have this delicate balance. So they need to be able to have this rich food source when they, for the two weeks that they show up in the Delaware Bay. They need there to be enough horseshoe crab eggs there that they can double their body weight and still make it to the Arctic. Um, so this is a really delicate balance, um, especially in the face of things like climate change, sea level rise. Um, so water temperature is the trigger for horseshoe crabs to spawn. If it happens too early or too late, their timing of their spawning um, doesn't coincide the right way with um, with the horse, with the shorebirds arrival. And so then things can go very badly, very quickly. Um, so there are scientists studying both the horseshoe crabs and the shorebirds to make sure that that synchrony is carefully monitored and managed. So we always want every year there to be enough horseshoe crab eggs so that the shorebirds can make it to the Arctic and continue their own species. Um, so it's a really delicate balance and any change in horseshoe crab population really has a huge effect on shorebird populations. And so any change, so there used to, there was um, a really intense harvest. Um, I think this is an image before the 1990s, obviously you can tell by, by the dress, but um, historically horseshoe crabs were harvested. They're really easy prey. Um, they don't have a lot of defensive mechanisms. They come up onto the beach um, by the hundreds of thousands every year. And if you've ever been on a beach with a horseshoe crab um, that has expired, they're really smelly. And so they were harvested for, um, for fertilizer. So I believe this was a, a fertilizer harvest on this image. Um, they're also harvested for bait. Um, they last a long time. It takes them a long time to break down because of all their hard parts and they stink the high heaven while they do it. So they're really attractive bait for conch and for eel. Um, and so there are, there's a fishery for, um, for conch and eel in New Jersey and also um, other states in the mid-Atlantic region. Um, so horseshoe crabs were a very popular um, bait item for that fishery and there weren't any controls on harvest. So semi-trucks would back up to beaches and load horseshoe crabs um, onto them. So those aren't just individuals lost from the population, that's their, um, their future generations also being taken away. So the population really plummeted. And so that was a big concern. Also, um, while we're in the land of concerns, I always wanna to jump to, but it's okay. Um, there's also, a, a, over time, obviously, as people move to coastal areas, because coastal areas are beautiful and we wanna have our vacation homes there, shoreline development has really narrowed um, a lot of the beaches that make Delaware Bay so special, like many coastal areas in the mid-Atlantic. And so the double um, double challenge of people are moving closer to the coast and developing shorelines, um, both with hardened structures that can trap horseshoe crabs and also just that they're, they're building in the place where horseshoe crabs would normally be laying their eggs, especially as sea levels rise. That interplay has been very damaging um, to horseshoe crab populations. Add to that some intense storms where there's been massive erosion events. Um, horseshoe crab spawning habitat is a very important resource that is really under threat. So over time in, in places like this, uh, what we end up seeing is horseshoe crabs end up on a road or under people's homes or in their yards during a big flooding event. And so that's not what people want. It's obviously not ideal for horseshoe crabs to be spawning in these areas either. And then anything that impacts horseshoe crabs and their ability to reproduce has a, a large effect also on shorebird populations. So the horseshoe crab population has declined and shorebird populations have followed. That really began, that, that free fall began in the 1990s. Um, and you know, folks were very alarmed. Um, the shorebird biologists were very alarmed, understandably that this was happening um, and so conservation action needed to be taken. So the birds faced a number of threats. So as I said, it's challenging to protect them because they have their overwintering habitat in South America. 
They have their important stopover habitat here in the Delaware Bay. And they also have threats in the Arctic, especially as climates change um, and habitats change up in, in the Arctic. So there's really three places. Um, it takes an entire hemisphere of cooperation and conservation to, um, to protect uh, shorebirds effectively. But in Delaware Bay, um, we can certainly do our part. And there's been um, some really spectacular efforts made. So some of the conservation successes, um, I mentioned harvest for bait and for fertilizer. Um, in the state of New Jersey, we have, um, as of 2018, I'm sorry, not 2018, I think it's 2011. Um, for some time now, we have had a moratorium on harvest of horseshoe crabs of any kind. So bait harvest, um, removing horseshoe crabs from the population for bait is no longer permitted. Um, it's actually such as, uh, the moratorium is such that even handling a horseshoe crab on a beach is technically um, an activity that's against the law. So possession of a horseshoe crab or any part of a horseshoe crab in the state of New Jersey without an appropriate permit is against the law. Um, and that's a really strict, um, it's a really strict regulation and it's been very effective. So horseshoe crabs that come up onto the beach um, are safe to do so and then safe to make it back into the water. Um, additionally, in New Jersey, there's a, the spawning beaches that are the most productive, so that historically the best spawning beaches, not only were purchased um, in part by uh, the Nature Conservancy, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to be part of their um, national wildlife refuge system. The state um, have, have purchased these beaches and then can close them um, or do close them during that important time for shorebirds. So from the end of May till early June, you can't even access a lot of the beaches where shorebirds and horseshoe crabs are um, have done their migration and are there. So shorebirds feeding and horseshoe crabs spawning. Um, and so these successes have been really, um, they've been really successful. We are starting to see horseshoe crab populations. So without the removal of those adults from the population, we're seeing more young horseshoe crabs make it onto the beach. So newly minted males and females um, coming onto the beaches and the population seems to be stabilizing, not at the same high level that it was historically, but it's out of free fall and starting to stabilize. Um, and the hope is that over time, um, that shorebird populations will do the same. So there's also been some important habitat restoration. Um, so making sure horseshoe crabs can make more horseshoe crabs, but also making sure land is protected and then appropriately restored so that you have a nice wide unobstructed beach um, where horseshoe crabs can come up onto the beach and spawn without getting stuck in riprap, without getting um, having their eggs washed out because the beach isn't wide enough. The American Littoral Society has done a lot of amazing um, restoration work for beaches for horseshoe crabs. And there's been a lot of science around finding those optimal conditions and then restoring them where they can within the Delaware Bay to help horseshoe crabs continue to make enough eggs to support the shorebird populations. So, I think another and another piece of the puzzle is helping people appreciate and understand horseshoe crabs. So thank you for sticking it out in this presentation and for your interest. It's really important um, for folks to understand um, what those those weird alien creatures that they see on the beach are doing. Um, so it's a big part of what I enjoy about May and June, and it's been a little challenging this season to not be out on the beaches doing the survey since it was officially canceled, understandably. Um, because of COVID-19 and concerns about getting people together, even for science. Um, the, there's two programs that um, really, in New Jersey, that are engaging folks to get hands-on experience with horseshoe crabs. So definitely stay tuned um, in future years for opportunities to join us in those programs. So the first is the annual horseshoe crab spawning survey that I mentioned at the, at the onset. Um, that I've been overseeing in New Jersey for, um, for 10 years and that the Conservancy has been participating in since the 1990s when it started. So this includes going out onto the beach um, in, in the evening, so when it's dark, so that we're not disturbing horse, uh, shorebirds that are feeding. 
and counting the number of sp uh, crabs spawning in a square meter. So that's that white square that you see in the image. Um, and so you count the number of males and the number of females. You can get an idea too from this image of just how densely these animals pack onto the beach in, this, in that sweet spot, in the zone where they need to be laying their eggs. Um, they're literally piled on top of each other. And that's a good spawning event. And that, sustaining that, um, that's, that's what we want to see for horseshoe crabs to continue to survive. So from this information, we can get the number of males and females and get a sex ratio. Um, there's a healthy population should have a lot more males than females um, because of how they spawn. And so we go out onto the beach. Um, there's 13 beaches, I think, in New Jersey and 12 in Delaware. And on the same night, on the same tide, everybody counts their beach. So we can get an idea of what that spawning horseshoe crab population looks like size-wise and if it changes over time. Other program. The other program is called um, Return the Favor, and so it's organized by the Wetlands Institute, and we participate as well, um, championing beaches. They're not taking any new volunteers this year, but definitely, um, if you've ever been out on the beach and you see a horseshoe crab turned over on its back, um, as I mentioned earlier, they have the ability to get themselves turned back over, um, but in the meantime, they're really vulnerable to drying out and to predation. And so given that the populations have been in so much trouble and that shorebird populations are so dependent on them, giving these animals um, a helping hand uh, has been really successful here in the state of New Jersey, both on raising awareness and also getting more, um, keeping more animals, adult animals in the population. So with Return the Favor, um, you go through some basic training and you go out onto the beach and you flip horseshoe crabs over. You might think, gosh, I don't need, I've been doing that for years. I don't need training to do that. Um, the things to remember are that in the state of New Jersey, you need a permit to be able to handle horseshoe crabs so that we can protect them really well. And we also get some information, we get some data when you participate in the program. So we fill out a simple data sheet. We count the number of males and females that are overturned. We also count the number of males and females that are stuck behind things or within things. So man-made structures or natural structures. Um, and this program has actually been successful in getting restoration done because you know if you can document that a certain boat ramp has been trapping horseshoe crabs um, at a certain rate, you know, hundreds of horseshoe crabs every tide cycle get stuck in this boat ramp on Delaware Bay. We've been successful, the program has been successful in rallying volunteers and getting grant support to be able to actually change those structures. So fill in the gaps where the crabs are getting stuck and, and things like that. So mapping those hazards for horseshoe crabs and actually doing something about them um, in addition to being able to give some male female sex ratio information. Um, so definitely um, stay tuned, stay connected with the Conservancy and be part of the Return the Favor um, program next year. Right now we're doing it with veteran volunteers. So we've got some really diehard people that are out um, rescuing horseshoe crabs pretty much every tide cycle. And I know that they would, they'll need some fresh blood by next year. Um, so folks to help out. So. Um, and there's really nothing like having your hands on a horseshoe crab, um, in my opinion, to be able to appreciate just the all of their amazing features and their um, ability to survive. All right. So uh, at this point, I had planned to take questions. I think um, the best way to do that is for folks to um, connect with the person who sent them this link. Um, and they can connect you with me or they might be able to help uh, answer your questions as well. But I really appreciate your attention and I hope that you can find a way to get out to the beaches um, of Delaware Bay and see these migrations for yourself. Thank you.